All right, we're in Matthew 10. We are going to finish it today. Not, not the book of Matthew, just Matthew 10. We're going to start in verse 16. Last week, um, we saw Jesus, uh, last week we saw him send out his disciples to minister, and before he sends them out, he gave them some instructions, but also this week what we're going to look at is he gives them some warnings, okay? So, Matthew 10, 16, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who will kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So that's where that came from. Um, A man, just kidding. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. So we've got a lot to cover. His first warning um, might be a little eye-opening. Jesus tells them that he's sending them out like sheep amongst wolves, Uh, which honestly might be something that's easy to understand. You might be like, yes, I totally get that sentiment. I feel like that. But then he instructs them, and by doing so, he instructs us to be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And I think hearing Jesus saying to be like a snake is a little weird, okay? Because we immediately go to the garden, right? A snake is rarely used as a description of, of a positive trait. You know, if someone came to me and was like, you're such a snake, you're like a snake in the grass. You're not like, well, thank you. That's awesome. That's how Jesus told me to be, like a snake in the grass, right? It's not a compliment, but he tells us to be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves, and it's kind of a strange mix. So what does this mean? It means we are to be innocent. We're not to fight the world like the world fights. We aren't to lie, cheat, and steal and spread the gospel by any means and destroy our adversaries. We are to be innocent before God, but not naive. Not naive. Don't you wish sometimes, I don't know if you do, but don't you wish sometimes you could be naive, as naive as you were as a child? You know, we say children are so innocent. And they are innocent, but there's also a bit of things they don't understand yet. And sometimes, man, it's like, oh, I wish I could go back to seeing the world through a child's eyes. Right? Because as we become an adult, we, we, we lose some innocence, but um, we become less naive. We come to understand that not everyone can be trusted. And, and, and I don't know if my children ever had that. They don't trust anybody. The minute people come up, they're like, how are you doing? They're like, 
what are you doing here? Um, you know, but as you get older, you, you learn not everything is as it appears. Not everyone tells the truth. Most people do. But here and there, you'll find people who, who lie. We come to understand things aren't always as they appear, right? Because it's easy to fake, right? I mean, we all, if you've ever dated anyone, you come to understand, right, that uh, people fake it, right? I, I mean, you know, when you go out on a date, first date, clean the car out. Is your car always clean? No. Do you have a house worth of stuff back there? Yes. Could you immediately leave the state and flee and have enough clothes and goodies in your car to survive for a month? Yes. I'm mostly guys. But when you go on a date, you go and buy armor all for the first time, right? You fake it. You're like, you love coffee? I love coffee, right? I, in Nacho Libre, there's this thing, and she's selling them all her favorite things. She's like, my favorite color is light tan, and my favorite thing is this. And he, at the end of like the sentence of all these things he loves, he's like, all those things you just said are all of my favorite things too, <laughs> right? And we come to learn, wait a minute, I think he might not be telling the truth. Or you get married, and you move in, and you're like, hmm, your house isn't as thick a span as it was when I came to visit before, Right? You can fake things. Um, and and I, I even, I have friends or had friends uh, like, who are like newer Christians. And, and, and they just like, they're just like, yeah, this person's, I, I, I met this person, they're a Christian. And they're like, oh, how do you know that? Well, I mean, it says on their status, they're a Christian, you know? And, 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 and every, it's like, oh, they're a Christian. They believe everything that I believe. And they, they're not really like understand like theology and differences and that, you know, some churches don't even follow God anymore. You know, they're just like, they just, and you're like, man, I wish I was like that. I had that innocence. Sometimes it takes being really hurt by Christians, being really hurt by the church to really understand, hey, wait a minute, the church is just made up of people. And sometimes they fail. And sometimes there are just people in the church that like really aren't really trying to follow God. Um, and I wish, I wish it was like that. I wish it was. That's how it should be. But it's not like that. So we have to be sensible. We have to be kind and non-judgmental, but we also have to be prudent and wise and discerning and ever watchful for people who would deceive us. We have to be vulnerable, but guarded. It's a strange mix. But the only way we can do this is by the power of the Holy Spirit who can open our eyes, right? The reason I can tell, and this isn't just about people being, this is about dealing with the world. There's, there's a way to tell if people may not be um, honest with you, Right? We can see things in their behavior that don't align with what they're saying. And the, and the closer we get to God, the more we know his word and we know the way he says to be, we can see when someone is not quite like that. And so we begin to, well, I, I, need, to, I need to watch you, okay? I'm not going to jump into this Ponzi scheme with you quite yet. I want to know who you are, right? By knowing the word of God, we can see what and who aligns with God's word. And by having his spirit in us, he can, he can help us discern. And his very next line begins with, be on your guard. Be on your guard. And we have to be on our guard as a church. There are so many churches right now who just change their doctrine and change everything uh, to what the world wants. And they put people in leadership that they don't really know that, that want different things. And then the whole, the whole church changes. And, it, and it's because we're not on our guard as Christians. He then tells them, you will not be able to avoid all trouble if you are obeying my commands and spreading the word. You'll be handed over to local councils and be flogged in the synagogues, brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and the Gentiles. You will be arrested. Brother will betray brother to death. A father will betray his child and children their parents. You'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Jesus never sugarcoated anything. He never promised or tried to promise peace and prosperity as men do when they're trying to sucker people in or take advantage of them. Jesus was honest about what would come. He was honest about what they could expect by following him. He doesn't offer comfort in any way. He does not offer ease in any way. And during, during World War II, Winston Churchill offered his countrymen, he didn't say, come to war, sign up. It's going to be a good time. He didn't. He offered blood, toil, sweat, and tears. Blood, toil, sweat, and tears. But it's the right thing to do. 
Maybe this is one place we've gotten things wrong. We just try to convince people just to say this prayer. It's all good. You don't need to change anything. Come along. God will bless you. And we offer this ease and this comfort and this peace and this prosperity that's not there. Rather than saying, welcome to the fight. Welcome to the fight between good and evil. The battle for souls where the prize and the forfeit is eternity where lives are on the line, where men and women you love and respect will fall to your right and fall to your left as you press on. Through the years, people will leave the battle and people will surrender, but we've been called to fight on, alone sometimes, alone if we must, fighting for the very ones who attack us, fighting for the very ones who abandon us and leave us all alone. We might be called fools and bigots, but we never give way to the gates of hell and we never surrender our hope because he goes before us and behind us. He is with us and he's called us to this fight. Now, would you like to pray with me and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Jesus never hid from the disciples what this decision would mean. He told them, you will be persecuted by the state. You will be persecuted by the government, both local and national. Councils, and governors and kings. You will be flogged. Flogging is not just a random beating. Flogging is like a corporal punishment. It is punishment by the state. You will be punished by the law for obeying me. You will be punished by the law for obeying me. It is not always possible, and you'll see this more and more, to be a good citizen and a good Christian. They ran up against this all the time. The Christians did run afoul of the government. They ran afoul of Rome. Why were they like, were they like picketing? Were they rioting? How did they run afoul of Rome? Can sweet, peace-loving Christians run afoul of the government? Now, ran afoul of Rome, I'll tell you how. They ne- though they never condemned slavery or never made attempts to free Roman slaves or, or they didn't go out and make... Um, and protest, what they did do was they treated them as equals. They said, you're not slaves here, they're our brothers. They are our equals. There were thousands of slaves in the Christian church, but the the inscription slave is not on a single headstone in the Roman Christian tombs. You'll see it elsewhere, but you will not see the word slave on a Roman Christian tomb because they treated them different. Slaves could hold high office within the church. Some elders and deacons were slaves, and the Christian church would sanction marriage between a high-born girl and a freedman, which was against Roman law. And this disrupted the very fabric of Roman civilization. Following God and treating people as God wanted them to be treated toward the very fabric of Roman society. They ran afoul of the government. Now, we are told to adhere to those placed over us. This means elected officials. It's not complete, complete anarchy. We don't live by our own laws. We don't say, well, Jesus didn't say anything about a speed limit in the Bible. Okay? So I go where the Spirit leads. And the Spirit's leading me. He's just leading me to get there fast. Right? That's not, that's not how it works. But when it's in conflict with what God says, God's law Trump's government law every time. But he tells them, and maybe we can see that. We're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I can see that. I mean, the Christians at the time could definitely understand what he was saying. Yeah, we will run afoul of the government. But he also tells them, you will be persecuted by synagogues. You'll be persecuted in the church, the place that was the church at the time. Places that were once following God, but weren't following any longer. Churches who become in love with their own doctrine, they love their own doctrine more than God, more than what the Word of God says. They have books of their own doctrine that are thicker than the Word of God, and if there, if there is a conflict, they go with their, their doctrine. Churches that were, will follow culture rather than the Word of God. You will be, prosec- you will be persecuted in those places. And you'll be prosecuted. They'll, they'll bring a lawyer and they'll charge you in there. Um, he then tells them, even some of your families will persecute you, will betray you to death because of me. And we see this. We see this in the Middle East in, in nations that are Islamic. If you become a Christian, they have these like, like, they'll kill them. And everyone's like, good job. 
because they brought so much shame on the family. We do see this, that families will betray families. And it says there's this thing people get concerned about. Uh, and it says, if you don't love God more than your son or daughter, you don't love me. And we're like, oh, I don't know about that. That doesn't make fun. I love my daughter. That's weird. And, and, and we might say, how does that even make sense? Let me, let me tell you how I've seen this in today's society. What we do is, often you will see someone will have a stance and say, I align with what the, what the Word of God says, and I think that this is a sin, because it says in the Bible it's a sin. But then their son or daughter gets all wrapped up in that sin, right? And they say, mm, I love them so much, I don't think it's a sin anymore. I'm adapting my theology, and I'm adapting and changing what the word of the Lord says, going against what God says, because I love my children so much. And they are in sin, and they refuse to change. We see even famous pastors, huge pastors, switch their stance on things like homosexuality because they have relatives. And that's really why everyone has switched their stance, why it's a conversation, even though the church has never, ever debated it, is because we know more and more people who are, and we love them. And we love them, as we should. But if you love them more than God, you go against God's word and change what God's word said, says, or leave the church because you love them more than God. That's how we see that in effect today, okay? Now, would you like to pray with me and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? right? You will be persecuted. But he tells them, if you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. And that, that does that, I don't know if that hits anybody, like, that seems like cowardice. Why would you flee? I know a lot of people, a, a lot of young people get involved in missions, and it's like, ah, to the death, you know, right? That's how we were in Jamaica. Wait, who else was trying to die there? I took the wheel of that car and was like, Wah! I'm just kidding. I was sitting in the back, it was Brenda who did that. No. Um, but it seems like, it might seem like cowardice, right? There may, and listen, there may come a point in time and, where we become martyrs, right? Who's looking forward to that? See, nobody. Back, in the, back then, they did. They wanted to be martyrs. They was like, and, and in some religions, it's like the ultimate prize, right? If you're a martyr, it's the ultimate prize. And so they go for that. And so this is why he's saying this, okay? Jesus is saying, look, you might die as a martyr. You might die over this. Don't seek it. We're not seeking it. We're trying to get people saved. The ultimate prize isn't martyrdom. We're going to get people saved. If they won't listen, leave. Don't, don't stay there and die, and then we can't spread the word. We're not trying to die here. You might, and almost all of them do, right? But he's like, we're not seeking death here. And then he says, we should expect this persecution. Why? because he was persecuted. And most of the disciples are killed in such an awful manner that it's very close to how Jesus died. And he says, hey, why should you expect anything different? Why should a servant expect anything different? And actually, the word that he uses um, is actually implies like, why should like a, like a general staff, not like staff, but like employees, you know, he's like, I I'm the general. I'm telling you how to be. We're an army. We're going together. Why would you expect you as a soldier, as the general staff, to you, that you be treated any differently than your general? And he was crucified on a cross. He was, and before that, they were constantly against him, trying to trap him. So why should, why should you be treated, expect anything different? He then tells them that the Son of Man will return before they finish going throughout Israel Remember, they're only going through Galilee at this time. And Jesus does return after his resurrection. Um, and they do move on to the Gentiles before all of Israel is saved. They move on to, to spread out to everyone else because they, it was rejected. But we are not to fear. He says, if you acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge you before my father. But if you disown me before others, I will disown you before my father. And we can disown Jesus in many ways. I know that all, whenever we picture this, we just picture like, they're like, we're going to like gun to our head. And they're like, we're going to kill you. Deny Jesus. And we're like, no, I won't. I'll never deny him. You know? And because then, because then you know it's like, I'm going to die right now. Heaven or hell. Heaven or hell. Heaven or hell. Right? 
And, and I think, but that's not, we can deny Jesus in so many, it's not just by saying, I deny Jesus, or I don't know him, right? Or I'm not a Christian. We, we can deny him every day through our speech, through our behavior, and through our actions. And everything we do, we can deny that we've ever come into contact with the living God. And that is how most people deny him today. And throughout these warnings, I hope we're all getting a sense of the importance of the Great Commission. I mean, Jesus is telling them, listen, listen, this is going to be tough. This is going to be hard. You might do this alone. Some of you are going to die. He's telling them that these are like warnings, warnings, warnings. This is important. This is serious. This is serious. There is so much at stake. Some of the things that Jesus say when we actually read his words are in striking contrast to the idea of him that we have when we don't read the Bible, right? It's a very different view. He says, I do not come to bring peace. Jesus said that. Can you believe it? I'm not paraphrasing. He said, I did not come to bring peace. I come with a sword. I come with a sword. A sword that will divide truth from lies. A sword that will divide light from dark. A sword that will divide death from life. And if that sword, I draw a line, where do you stand? I did not come to bring everyone together. I came to draw a line. I came to say, are are you with me or not? Are you you good or will you be evil? Dark or light? It's the ultimate battle of all time. If you love anything more than me, you're not worthy of me. You're not worthy to follow because it's going to be hard. And if you love anything more than me, something will cause you to fall away. Something will cause you to fall away. It could be a person. It could be a loved one. It could be a career. There are so many of these things that could cause you to turn and walk. So if that is you, you're not worthy of this because this is serious. You are not worthy of me. Following me might just cost you everything. Following me might just cost you everything, but if you love me, you will still follow. Now, who would like to accept me as your Lord and Savior? Eyes closed so no one else knows. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. It's a little different when we're reading the words of Jesus, right? Now, if everyone will say this prayer together so no one can actually hear the person that's saying this prayer, let's do it. Jesus is serious. One thing I think we lack today is a fear of God. We fear man more than we do God. We fear temporary punishment more than we do God over eternal punishment. He says, do not be afraid of the one who can kill the body. And the things we're afraid of are maybe being like, what, canceled? cast out, looked down upon, losing some status, not having the career we want. There's things that we can lose, and none of them are really death. They can lose their life. And he's like, don't be afraid of the people who can kill you because they can only punish you here in life. Fear the one who can punish you for all eternity. Fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Do we truly fear God or do we fear man? Do we, fear, do, we, do we care what God thinks about us or do we care what man thinks about us? He says, do not fear man or their persecution, even if it seems like the ultimate punishment is about to come. Know that there are worse things. But also, know this, through it all, through the persecution, through the loss, through the struggle, through the loneliness, I'll be with you. I'll go with you. If someone treats you well, I'll treat them well on account of you. If someone gives you a glass of water, when someone gives them a glass of water as they're on their journey, he says it's like giving a glass of water to a child, which a child, has anyone ever had someone, a child do something in return for you when you did a favor for them? I'd love to know how you're raising your kids. Giving a glass of water to a a little one is a favor that will not be returned. And you know it won't be returned, but you do it out of the goodness of your heart. He says, if someone does something for you out of the goodness of their heart, I'll bless them because they've done it to you, because I love you. If you're brought into the courts, 
to be brought before the Romans, if they're brought into a Roman court, I mean, they're lawyers at this time who have arguments, who are well-spoken, who are well-educated, going up against what? A fisherman? Not to diss on fishermen, okay? But at the time, they weren't educated. That might be like, man, I'm out of my league. There's no way I can win this. God says, don't worry about it. I will give you the words to say. And that doesn't mean we're not to, we're not to just be like, well, I'm not even going to study the Bible or do anything. God will give me the words to say, when, when, and it will be good, Right? Have you ever done that in like a, a speech class in college? You're like, I'm not even going to work it up. God's going to give me the words to say. Right? That's not, I mean, we need to know the word of God. It's not just like this magic thing of like, therefore, 20 score and four years ago, you know, not like God's going to do that. God's like, what are you talking like that for? Right? But what he will do was he'll bring the truth to light. He will bring the truth to light. The truth will be brought into the light. All the injustice all the lies, it will be brought into the light. In Exodus 14, 13 through 14, and this is a verse that um, I would like to say I thought of, but God really laid it on Daisy's heart, and we've been living by it. It says, Moses, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Don't be afraid. You know, he doesn't say go fight. He says, stand firm. Just don't be afraid and stand firm, and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you say, see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. And do you know why? Why does he fight for us? Why would God fight for us? Why does he go with us? He could just say, hey, I'm God. I'm Lord of the universe. Go do this stuff. But why would he go with us? Why would he fight for us? because he loves us. Here in Matthew, it says, are not two sparrows sold for one penny, penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. In Luke, the way he says it, he says, are not five sparrows, like, let's watch the math here, okay. Matthew says, are not two sparrows sold for one penny. And Luke says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies. They even had deals back then. They even had deals back then. Isn't that amazing? They're like, you can get two sparrows for a penny, but hey, if you buy four sparrows, you get one free for two pennies. And they're like, what a deal. And someone's like, we don't even need five sparrows. And you're like, yeah, but it's such a deal. We'll figure out what to do with the sparrows. Well, I, I've always wanted a pet sparrow, right? They even, had, they even had deals back then. But notice what Luke is saying here is even the free sparrow, the sparrow that is worth absolutely nothing, that is thrown in and worth nothing, God notices them. He says, not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. The worthless sparrow will not fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And the way that it's worded, it might give us a picture of like a bird dying and God's like, no, that was Elliot. I loved Elliot. He was such a great bird, right? Like, that's what we picture. Like, I hurt every time something dies. That's why I want everyone to be vegetarian, right? He doesn't say that. But that's how we picture it, and it's a great sentiment. But, like, let's be honest. We all notice when something dies, right? We got some hermit crabs for our kids. And, you know, it's all children. They're like, we're going to love them. We're going to feed them. We're going to do everything. And you're like, no, you're not. I know that you're not. So you assess when you're getting an animal, am I willing to do these things? Right? Am I willing to do this? Right? And so, you know, they, and they were really excited about it first. But the thing about hermit crabs even is like, like, what fun are they? Have you ever seen anyone play with a hermit crab? Have you ever seen a hermit crab come out of a shell in the middle of a day? They don't. It's basically like having shells in a cage that you have to maintain. They died like seven months ago. We had no clue. I'm just like putting food and put food and water in there. And Flynn's like, they're dead, man. They died. They buried under the sand for seven months. I'm like, they're molting. They're good. They're, they're good. This is something they do. This is something they do. Don't worry about it. Right? But then, nobody cares. But then, when they died, when I finally was like, let's just dig down and just see if they're down there. It's been a very long time. I don't want to waste any more of our water on these hermit crabs. They died, oh, whoo, whoo. the world ended for my children. Those shells, 
had died. Okay? We buried them. Okay? We went outside. We played Into the West, which is a nerd's version of the Titanic song. It's uh, by Annie Lennox. It's when um, Frodo goes west. It's a very sad song. Daisy has asked me to play it at her funeral. So I got a little teary-eyed at the hermit crab's um, death. But we noticed when they died. Okay? But that's not what he said. He said to blave, which means to bluff. No, what he said, the wording, the wording is not meant to be, uh, God notices when a sparrow dies. It's not what he says, okay? The wording is actually not one of them will light on the ground outside of your father's care. Meaning, every time the bird touches the ground, God notices, which means every time it takes off from the ground, God notices. Every time a bird's foot touches the ground and lights back up, he notices, meaning every action of that worthless bird is noticed by God. And it doesn't even say he just notices. He says, that is not outside of my care. I care for that worthless bird, and I notice every single action that it makes. And how much more are you to me than that sparrow? Not just that sparrow, but many sparrows. You are worth more to him. And if he notices every single action of a worthless little bird, how much more does he notice of your life? When we see this, it's like, man, being a Christian can be very hard, and it can be very hard. It can be very hard. We have seasons. There can be times when we feel, we'll talk about there are times when we, we feel like it's very rough, and we might not feel like God's there. We might not feel like we will survive. And when you read this and you see what you're up against, when the disciples see it, it might sound like, man, oh, that sounds awful. How can we do that? But he gives them a promise that is stronger than any of the things they'll be up against. It's like, but I, God, will go with you because I love you. And I know everything that you do, and I watch everything that you do. And I love you so much. I will go with you. I'll go before you. I'll go behind you. I'll prepare the way. And even though those problems seem insurmountable, even when it seems like everyone and everything is against you, even when it seems like you can take no more, I will be with you. And I'm all that you need. I'm all that you need. And I will notice single thing that happens to you. Every single thing I will notice and I will bring blessing upon those who bless you and curses upon those who curse you because I go with you. Lord, I just thank you. I just thank you that you love us so much, Lord, that you go with us, that you go before us and behind us, Lord. Lord, I know that there are times, and many of us have experienced them and will experience them, tough times where we feel alone, Lord, when we feel like it's us against the world, Lord. And I just pray that you would help us to be like the disciples and be courageous. Lord, and that courage comes from trusting you, trusting that you are faithful, trusting that you are good, that you are everything that you say you are, Lord. And I just thank you that you love us so much and that you go with us and you strengthen us, Lord, and you give us power and authority and by your blood, Lord. We are washed clean. I just thank you for the blood of the Lamb. I thank you for the power in the name of Jesus. I thank you that we have been called, that you've chosen us. We didn't fall into this. You have called us by name. And I just pray that we can walk with our heads held high, Lord. That we will truly walk as we have been called to be, Lord. That we will go into battle knowing that you go before us, Lord. Help us to just trust you. Help us to stand and be still, 
and not fight as the world fights, Lord. Help us to be as innocent as doves and as shrewd as snakes, Lord, trusting you for the victory, trusting in your words for the victory, trusting that you go before us. Lord, I just pray that when we see the news, we are not worried. When something in our family happens bad, when something happens to our friend, we are not overcome with anxiety, Lord, because we know in our hearts that you are with us, that you love us, and that you go with us, Lord. We just thank you that you go with us, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. We thank you that you are God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.